Today we're going to take a tour of Miami Beach's Holocaust Memorial. Kira and I have been living in Miami Beach for a few months now. Just like when we first moved to downtown Miami a year earlier, we have been wandering around and getting to know this little city on the other side of Biscayne Bay. It turns out there's a lot to discover. Late one afternoon, we were out for a drive in South Beach and decided on a lark to stop by a memorial I had seen from the road several times. I had assumed it was a war memorial of some sort. Within a few minutes of arriving, we finally realized it is actually a memorial to the dead and survivors of the Holocaust. We came back the next day to explore it. Human history has seen altogether too many genocides and other murders of masses of people for various ideological and political reasons. In the lead up to and during the World War II, the Japanese, Germans, Soviets, and other regimes began displacing and murdering vast numbers of people as part of campaigns of ethnic cleansing, socialist revolutions, and power consolidation. But Nazi Germany's obsession with devising a final solution to the Jewish question inevitably led them to murder an estimated 6 million Jews during World War II. While the term Holocaust has a general meaning, it has also come to be a formal name for this particular dark crime. There are Holocaust memorials and museums in many cities around the world, but I think Miami Beaches is beautiful, educational, and transformative. It's hard not to be silenced into solemn contemplation when you're here. I have a lot of my own thoughts about the history of this period and of the Holocaust, but that's too deep a topic for this video. Instead, I want to focus on my own impressions of the memorial. Everyone will have different takeaways from any work of art. Here are some of mine. We also had the pleasure of talking at some length with Dr. Helen Sachs Chasset, a docent at the memorial, and Andrew Tabone, a volunteer. Both went out of their way to greet us and other guests, and both had great things to share. Unfortunately, we didn't bring a good microphone with us to record audio. Still, I've included some quotes from our discussion. One critique I have of many memorials I've seen before is that they feature names of the dead without providing much historical context. As time and people pass away, these names become practically meaningless to later visitors. Here's one place where the Holocaust Memorial shines. It etches in stone quite a bit of the history of the pogroms in Germany and other countries that came under its control during the war. There are perhaps fewer than 400,000 Holocaust survivors still alive. Soon there won't be any remaining. The images and narrative text found on these walls also qualify this memorial as a museum. They can help children and other casual visitors immerse themselves viscerally into what could otherwise be the dry lesson one suffers through to pass a class in school. People come and they're like, I've been to so many memorials all over the world. I've never seen anything like this right. before. Right. I said, this is because it comes out of people who lived to the, the horrors of it. And not only did they want a place because they had no cemeteries, they had no place to go. But at the same token, they wanted a place to tell what happened and teach the story for lessons in the future. Dr. Fagan and then the others, they had to be the first ones to go to the City of Miami Beach Commissioner. And the commissioners unanimously at that time, this is mid-1980s, unanimously agreed that they would provide a site for uh, these people to build. A so I was wondering about that. So the city provided the site, yes. and uh, most of it, I assume most of the rest of it was paid for with private donations? Yes, it was. Uh, there were original, uh, you know, founders that gave substantially, but of course it was above and beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that came from public donations here. Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. to say that this site was not you know, a political mandate or part of anything like that. This was created from people who experienced it. You know, when, when we take the, the youngsters through, because during the week, during the, um, you know, uh, school season, and I ask them, you know, to take guesses about how many camps there were. The guesses they make, oh, you know, 50, 30, you know, 30, and, and then I keep saying more and more, you know, 100. <laughs> 
and, and they're shocked when they hear that there were 44,000 death camps, concentration camps, labor camps, and ghettos, and that yeah. death and persecution occurred in all those locations. I appreciate that this memorial does not shy away from the grim reality of the Holocaust. This isn't a sterile list of names or purely abstract aesthetics. Everywhere you go, you are reminded of death and misery. And yet it's also not simply a macabre recitation either. There's a strangely peaceful detachment to it, a cocoon of safety that lets you examine the horrors from a safe distance, and to get as close as you care to in facing that grim reality. One of the first things I notice is the heavy use of rough-hewn white marble everywhere. My sense is that it evokes a, a certain purity, a distance, a cleansing, an openness to sunlight and truth. Once you've had your warm-up with a strangely serene walk along the trellis-lined history lesson, you're confronted by a tunnel leading to the heart of the memorial. The tunnel tapers to be smaller as you walk down it toward the central courtyard. Natural light pours into this almost claustrophobic space through narrow slots in the walls and ceiling that emphasize the feeling of an impenetrable prison. Our hosts explain that this tunnel is meant in part to emulate the experience of walking down into a gas chamber. The walls are emblazoned with the names of just some of the countless concentration camps. I don't know if this is intentional, but the walls of the dome where you enter the tunnel look to me like they are spattered with blood. All throughout our visit, I was struck by so many symbols apparently embedded in the total design. I mentioned the slots in the walls. In some ways, it's hard to capture the vibrancy of the world outside as seen through these narrow slots. I couldn't help but feel strangely trapped and that the world outside was so far away. Such an evocative experience. By now you can already see that the central courtyard features quite a statuary, but I wanted to capture the perfectly haunting plight of the little girl that calls out to you as you enter. From the road and from outside the central courtyard, you can see the hand right reaching to the sky, but from there it is not clear what the tatters along the arm are. It's only when you get here that you see the stunning scene of so many tortured figures around and ascending up the arm toward the hand. It's possible that the artist wanted to somewhat conceal this painful scene from the public, and yet the hand reaches out from the abyss and beckons you to come witness the fullness of the horrors. I love that you can walk among the statues. Despite their clay-like abstraction, these figures convey their torments so perfectly. The dying carry the dead, parents hand off children, elders cherish final moments together. All are bereft of clothing and hair to illustrate how they have nothing left but the bone-thin remains of their dignity. I will admit that I still don't have a clear understanding of what the artist intended one to take away from the totality of the sculpture installment. It's possible that it's many different ideas that are roughly brought together for aesthetic reasons but it's more likely that I'm missing some messages. In any case, I keep thinking about it and keep discovering more as I do. That's one quality of excellent art. When I look at the lower portion of the central statue, I get a sense of people fleeing upward to escape. Children are handed by people on the ground to adults on their way up. Most seem to be helping or interacting with others among them. And yet, I notice that the spaces between the people seem striated in a way that evokes wisps of smoke. Perhaps this signifies not the living, but the ghosts of the dead ascending together the smokestack of a crematorium. Fittingly, the wrist of the arm is tattooed with a serial number, but the hand is the piece that has been most difficult for me to integrate into the fuller picture. Perhaps it is simply meant to signify the grasping of man reaching out for help and finding none, which is a fitting allegory for the plight of Jews during the Stark period. They seemed largely ignored by the rest of the world until the Allies began liberating the concentration camps. I kept walking around and filming the same things over and over. I've scrapped much of that footage because it's repetitive. But I also kept poring over this footage and discovering more detail. Each of the figures tells a story. One man holds a hand to his throat as he gasps for air, 
An emaciated man weeps for the dead child in his lap. A woman pulls her crying son away from his grandfather. A prostrated man lies among the scattered dead, far from the pillar and reaches out to those at its center. Each figure has a personality and laments as the end comes nigh. I'll leave you off at that thought and invite you to contemplate all this for yourself. Who are these people individually? What are they saying to you? What do you take away from this statue? And moreover, from the entire memorial and museum. I'd also welcome you to share your thoughts below. And I hope you get an opportunity to visit next time you're in the area. See the description below for some relevant links.